Good morning. We're going to read the scripture in just a moment, but I'd like to just say a few things before we dive into 2 John. My name is Craig Hadley. I'm the pastor of Paradox Church in Redlands, California, which is an open and affirming congregation. I want to tell you that you two, that all of you are in great hands because you two have tremendous pastors. Not only are they kind, compassionate, and loving, they are absolutely brilliant. I've had some very deep discussions about God and the church with them. And I know that you all know how brilliant they are by the fact that they scheduled a guest speaker five days after the election happened. (laughs) Just really smart move, Jen and Jacob. Wow. (laughs) In all seriousness, though, you are in great hands, and you are very lucky to have them as your pastors. I have been impressed with every interaction. They are great people, and I want to thank them for the honor of speaking this morning. The second thing I want to say is um, the sermon is meant to start a discussion rather than end one. At the end of my sermon, I will be speaking about the election in a religious setting. These are not topics you bring up in order to get everyone to harmonize and get on the same page, right? I'm gonna do my best to make sense of whatever all of this is and try to help us understand where God is leading us. And that will both, I think, simultaneously comfort you and challenge you. And so I'm asking you to give me some grace as I try to stumble through the darkness of whatever this is, and hope, I hope that this sermon will start a discussion that starts a discussion in your life about what it means to become a more loving person. Now, with that in mind, let's go to 2 John together, and I would like for you to pull out your bulletin and read from there. Um, as we read it, I actually want us to read the entire book. It's only 13 verses long, and I feel like this book speaks a lot about what we are going through in 2024. Now, when I study the Bible, I like to make an outline. I actually pull out a piece of paper, and I try to summarize the thoughts so I can see the the literary structure of where the author is going. So I'm going to actually put an outline up on the screen, and we're going to highlight what it is that John is trying to say and how he supports his argument. So let's read verse 1. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. These first three verses are the opening greeting of the letter. Nothing too complicated there. Verse 4 then says, I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as have we, we have been commanded by the Father. So you see, John apparently lives in an era of misinformation. And so he wants to celebrate what is true, just like we do today when we hear false claim after false claim on a repeated basis. So verse 4 is just a celebration of the truth. Verse 5 and 6 then reads, But now, dear lady, I ask you, Not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. Let us love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment just as you have heard it from the beginning. You must walk in it. So in verse 5 and 6, John says we are to love one another. This is a divine commandment, and people will know we are Christians by our love. And then as you all turn the page, as we could all hear that together, John says in verse 7, many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a bit of a shocking turn here in 2 John, right? Because just a few verses back, he said, we are called to love one another. And then just a few verses later, he says, there are people who are literally the antichrist. They will deceive you. And so what John is telling us is that while he is imploring people to love one another, there is an asterisk on that commandment. There is an asterisk that you don't have to love everyone, which raises the question, who is it that John feels like is deceiving others? Who is John upset about, so upset that he would call them the Antichrist? Well, if you know a little bit about the historical context of John, one of his contemporaries that was also his rivals was a man named Serenthus. Let me hear you say Serenthus this morning. 
Now, Cerinthus was a leader of proto-Gnosticism, which is a big, fancy term. Let me break it down with just a few drawings. The first is Gnostics did not believe that Jesus was born of a virgin birth. Jesus instead was born the good old-fashioned biological way, and Joseph was Jesus' biological father. And Jesus, for the first three decades of his life, lived a very normal, human, imperfect life. Jesus was fully human, Gnostics would say, for three decades. Then, when Jesus decided to be baptized, the Spirit of God descended from heaven, took over the controls of Jesus' body, and all of a sudden, the body became fully divine, and the human Jesus ceased to exist for the time being. Then God walked among us for one or two or three years, depending on which gospel you read, and as soon as Jesus went toward the cross, uh, there was this moment when the Spirit of God abandoned the body of Jesus and went back up into heaven while th the human Jesus returned on the cross and suffered a terrible death. The reason Gnostics believe this is because they believed it was impossible for God to suffer. And so the idea of a suffering God on a cross is one they did not want to believe in. So this is an early version of Gnosticism. It is something that, is, that was very real in John's day and age, and it was headed by a guy named Cerinthus. So when we go back to our outline and we put an asterisk for, next to love one another, if you read verse 7 once again, it says, Many deceivers have gone into the world, those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. They are denying the humanity of Jesus, these Gnostics, and they need to be silenced. So the asterisk is revealed in verse 7, which is, except Gnostics. <laughs> Love everyone you encounter, except the Gnostics. John then goes on in verse 8 to say, Be on your guard so that you do not lose what we have worked for, but may receive a full reward, a.k.a. heaven. In other words, verse 8 says, Save yourself! You have eternal life at stake, and if you associate with them, you will put all of that at risk. He goes on to write, Everyone who does not abide in the teachings of Christ but goes beyond it does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive and welcome this person into your house. For to welcome is to participate in the evil deeds of such a person. John says you need to show these Gnostics the door. Better yet, don't even let them in the door. Slam the door in their face. These Gnostics will contaminate your house, and you are actually participating in their heresy if you share a meal with them. We then read in verse 12, although I have much to write you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to, com to come to you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sisters send you their greetings. These last two verses are just a farewell. That's the entire book of 2 John. Now, what's interesting about this book is there is a story that is not recorded in the Bible, but it is recorded deep in the annals of church history. This is a story recorded by a man named Polycarp and handed down from generation to generation. This story takes place at a Roman bathhouse where John and his disciples, one of which was a man named Polycarp, uh, were taking a bath. And this scene is captured by a Dutch artist named Jan Lyken, who engraved this scene about 300 years ago. Now, here's how the story unfolds. John and his disciples are enjoying a bath when all of a sudden, Cerinthus, you know, the leader of the Gnostics, and his disciples showed up to the same bathhouse. The moment got icy cold, even though they were in warm baths. And then all of a sudden, John turned to his disciples, including Polycarp, and said, let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Cerinthus, the enemy of the truth, is inside. John is worried that God is so angry with Cerinthus that God will cause the bathhouse to collapse, and John does not want to be collateral damage. So John and his disciples got up, left the bathhouse, and wouldn't you believe it, the bathhouse didn't crumble. Now, this story is the embodiment, the narrative embodiment of what the entire book of 2 John is about. 
what is John teaching us, not only in this story, but what is written in the Bible in 2 John? John is teaching us that your testimony is the way you treat the people who are like you. And what John wants is John wants a group of people who are concerned with the truth first and foremost, at all costs even, and we are to love one another with such a uh, contagious kind of love that outsiders would change their wicked ways and want to join us in droves. And while that may sound logical and rational and good, there's just one problem with this entire logic, isn't there? Because a few decades before all of this was written, there was another man who was walking around on the other side of the globe, and his name was Jesus of Nazareth, who we refer to as Jesus Christ. There is this moment in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus is delivering the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus is delivering the Sermon, about a third of the way through, Jesus is talking to other poor and oppressed people who are heavily taxed. He says to them something that is so stunning, Christians would prefer that it wasn't in the Bible at all. Jesus says to them, you have heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for your persecutors. This will prove that you are children of God. For God makes the sun rise on bad and good alike. In other words, Jesus is saying the sun is a blessing in all of the warmth that it gives. God does not put the cosmic hand of God in front of the sun to make it so that some people have to live in shade. God continues to give this gift freely no matter how good or how bad each human being is. Jesus goes on to say God's reign falls on the just and the unjust. He then goes on to say, if you love those who love you, what merit is there in that? Don't tax collectors do as much? Now, tax collectors in Jesus' day and age were not these loyal employees to the IRS. Tax collectors were people who sold out their friends and family for profit to the Roman Empire. And they would profit off the backs of the people they loved and line their own pockets while being an agent for the people that oppress them. In other words, tax collectors were people who the common person felt like had sold out the soul of their nation. I don't know if anyone comes to mind for you today, but just try to imagine and empathize with these ancient folks, shall we? But Jesus says, even the people who've sold out our nation, can't they do that? Don't they just love each other? Is it really impressive if you only love the person who is like you? Jesus goes on to say, if you greet only your sisters and brothers, what is so praiseworthy about that? Don't the Gentiles do the same? Don't the non-religious, can't they, aren't they able to function at that level? And when I think about stories about Jesus, there are so many stories where Jesus puts his money where his mouth is. He goes to those same tax collectors and eats with them over and over again. He even calls one of them to be his disciple. And this made people angry, as you can imagine, right? So angry that they confronted Jesus and they said, what reason can the teacher have for eating with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus, overhearing the remark, said, people who are in good health don't need a doctor, sick people do. Go and learn the meaning of the words from the prophet Hosea, I desire compassion, not sacrifices. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Which raises the question, what is Jesus actually teaching us, not only by this story of eating with tax collectors, but also asking us to love our enemies? Jesus is teaching us that your testimony is the way you treat the people who are not like you. So, when you think about the contradiction between the stories of John and Serinthus and the teaching of Jesus and eating with tax collectors, there is a path before all of us whenever we are confronted with people who are not like us, who act differently than us, who have different moral compasses than us. And the question as we reach this path, this fork in the road is, who do you want to follow? The way of John, I believe, leads to self-preservation but the way of Jesus leads us to miraculous love. 
John will lead us to shun people we do not like, while Jesus leads us to find ways to include those who are difficult to include. John leads us into a path where our enemies still have power over us. Think about that story at the bathhouse. What if Polycarp loved taking baths? And they got there for just five minutes, Serinthus shows up and John's like, we gotta leave. And Polycarp's like, I was just starting to enjoy myself. <laughs> and John says, nope, we can't be anywhere near them. If they show up, we have to change who we are. Meanwhile, the way of Jesus leads us into a path of liberation from our enemies. I believe that any group can lead you in the ways of John, but only the inspiration of God can lead us in the ways of Jesus. And if my atheist and agnostic friends are here this morning, while that may be heavily religious language, I would say that the path of Jesus is ultimately one that you don't have to believe in anything supernatural. Instead, it leads to a life that is worth living when you are able to love your enemies. Which brings us to the presidential election. Now, I don't like sermons where you try to guess how the pastor voted, so I'm just going to be very upfront with all of you. I voted for Kamala Harris. I, uh, I'm a registered Democrat, and uh, I, I had no question in my mind I would be voting for her. Now, if you voted for Donald Trump and you are here, which I am sure there is someone here or people here who have voted for Donald Trump, uh, you may be tempted to tune me out. Um, this is a lot of our culture today because the algorithms will turn you away from what I'm about to say next. But I will, and asking you to hear me out because this is a sermon about loving people who are not like us. And you may enjoy some of this and you also may be challenged by some of this. This is not a sermon about how one party needs to love their enemies and the other does not. This is a sermon about how all of us need to learn how to love our enemies, even when it's extremely difficult. And I have to ask a question when we talk about loving our enemies in light of this presidential election, which is, does anyone want to love their enemies right now? I have to tell you, it's even hard for me to say yes to this question because it has been such a difficult last several days here. And when I think about all the things that are going on, not only inside me, but that you have carried with you here, elections take a toll on all of us. And it can be hard to try to figure out what to do next when your side either wins or loses. And there is this temptation to believe that we do not have to learn how to love the people who are not like us, and yet that is so central to our identity as Christians. And so if you feel like it's hard for you to love an enemy right now, I want you to know I understand. And as pastors, um, this may come as a news flash to some of you, but we don't have any special access to God that you don't have. Uh, pastors Jen and Jacob are great, um, I know, that they don't have a special room where God speaks to them. I don't have a special room where God speaks to them. God speaks to us just as much as God speaks to you. We're regular people, just like you, trying to figure this out, which raises the question, so what does a pastor do, and why should we actually listen to what a pastor has to say? Uh, I'm going to defer to a great Lutheran minister, her name is Nadia Bowles Weber, who in her book wrote a paragraph that I want to share with you this morning because it embodies what I think pastors should be doing in times like this. Um, if you don't know Nadia Bowles Weber, she uses some colorful language and she still is loved by God. It's amazing the love of God and what it covers, right? But she writes this in her book, Acts and All Saints. So often in the church, being a pastor or a spiritual leader means being the example of quote unquote godly living. A pastor is supposed to be the person who is really good at this Christianity stuff, the person others can look up to as an example of righteousness. But as much as being the person who is the best Christian can feel a little seductive, it's simply never been who I am or who my parishioners need me to be. I'm not running after Jesus. Jesus is running my butt down. Yeah, I'm a leader, but I'm leading them into the street to get hit by the speeding bus of confession and absolution sin and sainthood, death and resurrection. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a leader, she says, but only by saying, oh, screw it, I'll go first. 
This morning, I know what I do not want to do. But this morning, I also know what I need to do. So this morning, as a pastor, I'm saying to all of you, screw it. I'm going to go first. And this is intimidating because I'm worried I'm selling out people whose human rights are threatened right now. But I have to ask the question, how can we move forward if it is not moving forward in love? Now this is a difficult thing to do, loving our enemies, and so I've come up with three steps that I've found helpful in my own life for learning how to love people who are difficult. The first step, as we ask how do we love our enemies, the first step is to lament. Um, as you all know, I'm, or as, as you should know, uh, I, I think therapy is essential to healthy living. And one thing that is great about therapy is you can say things without fear of judgment. And so when you lament in therapy and you say what's genuinely in, on your mind and in your heart, you are able to say things and have them validated in some way, shape, or form. Now, what's really beautiful about this community is just this past Wednesday, you all held an event here in which you came together and you grieved all the heartache you were feeling as the result of this election. Um, Pastor Jen referenced this in her video. She uh, also said in her Facebook post this week, she called this a gathering to, quote, hold space for one another and share poems, thoughts, and scripture that expressed our feelings about the election results. It was so sacred and healing. I love those words she chose, which was sacred and healing. You cannot learn to love your enemies without first giving yourself time to lament, to be honest with your feelings and who you are. Uh, at my church, Paradox, on Friday, we held an event similar to this. We called it Grieving Together. And we, just like you guys, we read poems, we sang songs, we had people from the congregation share a lament. And I'm going to share you, with you a few paragraphs from my lament that I shared that night um, because I need you to hear me honestly say these things before I talk about loving our enemies moving forward. So this is from my lament on Friday night. I said, I am deeply saddened by the prospect of another four years of Donald Trump as president. As someone who has years of experience getting in trouble for the things I say out loud, I am agitated that Trump never gets in trouble for all the stupid things that he says out loud. The volume of garbage flowing from his mouth makes the San Timoteo dump look like a mere pimple. I am frequently asked, how can someone claim to follow Jesus and still vote for that man? The answer is simple. Trump's make, Trump makes promises that many Christians will say remind them of their understanding of heaven. After all, in their version of heaven, there is a wall, there's only Christians, there is a Muslim travel ban, all of your enemies have been bombed with hellfire, and there is so much money that even the streets are paved with gold. When your idea of heaven is the elimination of people who are not like you and a giant pile of cash, you end up believing that a vote for Donald Trump is exactly what God would want you to do. And while this does not reflect all of the Christians who vote for Trump, I can comfortably say it represents a sizable portion of the Christians who vote for Trump. Thank you for allowing me to share that with you this morning. I don't think it's possible to move forward without giving your space, yourself time and space to lament. And honest lament is necessary. Now the next step is very difficult, and it's a step that I came across in therapy, and that step is after lament, you then practice empathy. Now, I have to tell you that uh, I've been working through how to love some of my enemies in my own therapy sessions with my therapist. If I look like I have it all together, um, when I had a particularly difficult person in my life, um, I told my therapist after session after session, I finally said to her, I said, I just want to be less angry going forward. And she said, well, Craig, the only way out is empathy. I immediately buried my head in my hands and said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And she very kindly said, we'll try again next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to empathize with your enemies, right? And when you are able to start empathizing, the, the thing my therapist worked with me on is she's like, can you just start with something small? Can you say, it's hard going from, it's hard when they think about this person, it's hard for you. Can you just say it's hard having the home life they have? Or it's hard driving that far to work? Or something like that. She said, if you can just start with a small shred of empathy for them, 
you are then opening the door to be less angry going forward. And so you just start to practice little tiny bits of empathy going forward. How can I see something from someone else's perspective, even if I don't agree with it? And during this time, you can reflect on your own life. You can see if there's anything that you need to say you're sorry for or confess. Doesn't mean you do, but you can do that inward journey. Um, you can ask questions like, is there anything I was wrong about? Is there anything I can say I'm sorry for? As my good friend Kim says, um, she tells me frequently, she says, always own the things that are yours and let go of the things that are not. Never say you're sorry for something you don't feel, but is there anything you can own? And after some soul searching, there are some things that I can empathize with for the people who did not vote like me. But I want to express all those with the next steps in how we love our enemies. And that moves us from empathy to action. So action asks us what steps are we willing to take, and you particularly, and what steps are you not willing to take? And when I think of the United States of America and the stunning results from this past week, um, I have a few things I would like to say to people who voted for Donald Trump. Um, I want you to know I never thought Donald Trump could win the popular vote. On Tuesday morning, if you would have asked me, can he win the popular vote, I would have said, no, absolutely not. I stand before you today saying I was wrong. It took me by complete surprise. The other thing I can say with the empathy I have now is um, with this popular vote that took me by surprise, I am the one who is out of touch with America. I feel like I need to listen more. And I am committed to listening more going forward. The other thing I want to express through empathy is um, I want to say that binary politics are hard. I can understand that if someone wanted change, the only viable democratic option was Trump. That's just the way binary politics works. And it's a frustrating system for so many of us, but that's something I can empathize with even though I think it's a wrong vote. Now, the next thing is, is there anything that I can say or that I want to say I'm sorry for? And after some soul search this week, I can think of one thing that I do want to say I'm sorry for. We had this event growing to, or grieving together at our church. And the reason we had it was because on Wednesday morning when the election of results were official, I got so many phone calls and texts from distraught church members. And everyone was grieving, and I didn't really have anything to make them feel better. And I asked the question, what can we do? And the only option was, well, we can get together and just be together as we grieve and express our heartache. Now, my church is not made up of all Harris supporters. Um, and there were some people in our church who expressed concern for this event. They heard that we were doing this, and they said, well, would you be willing to throw a party for us? And I said, no, absolutely not. And they asked, why not? I said, because your party's taking place over the next four years. Enjoy it. <laughs> they then asked, if Harris won and Trump lost, would you still hold this event? And that's a good question. The answer is no. And I know it's no, because when I think back to four years ago, when Donald Trump lost, there wasn't one of my church members who reached out to me and said they were dealing with heartache. I received zero phone calls or texts. And we have these people in our congregation, and none of them felt like they could reach out to me. I know what I said more than four years ago, and I do not blame them for being hesitant to reach out to me. So I want to be very clear. I am sorry to the people I serve who felt like they could not express their heartache to me because they voted differently than me. I do not want to be a pastor or a Christian who only serves people who vote the same as me. Grieving together was a healing and sacred event, just like your event this past Wednesday night was a healing and sacred event. But if I am only willing to hold an event like this for people who vote the same as me, then I am following the ways of John and not the ways of Jesus Christ which is why four years from now, Paradox will be hosting Grieving Together 2 on November 10, 2028. 
no matter which candidate wins or loses, we will hold a gathering for those experiencing heartache from this election. And I want to invite Claremont UCC to do the same here by holding something similar. Now, I tell you this because even though I may be feeling joy instead of heartache because my candidate won, I would be honored if anyone who saw the world differently than me wanted me to sit with them in their grief and listen to them without judgment, without interjection or correction, but only with presence as they lament honestly the things that they feel. If I am unwilling to do that, then I am prioritizing the ways of John over the ways of Jesus. How do we love the people who are not like us, the people who are difficult to love? With lament and empathy and action. And why do we do this? It's because we are following the ways of Jesus Christ and not John the Apostle. And we are called as Christians to respond to hatred, vitriol, and violence with love. This is the presence of God. My friends, may you find the courage to love the people who are not like you. Amen.